All right, Guy, I have, I've got a sad story for you. And I'm wondering if this has happened to you before. We recently lost a client. And this, this is this that has come happened up. to us too. It, <laughs> I didn't mean this week, um, but it was one of those things where you're like, "This should not have happened," right? And and so what I want to do is we're we're now talking to other firms in the Colorado market. I want us to share with our audience what what you and I go through when we look at a law firm website as to whether or not there's room for major improvement or if they've kind of got all their stuff dialed in. And for me, Guy, a firm that's got all of its stuff dialed in, I probably know the agency that's doing the work. And it's not necessarily a client that I want to pick up. We, yeah, I, I tend to find that I like to find those guys who are, are not doing a great job so we can come in and make some major changes. S- similar, similar perspective on your part? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually curious to hear more about your story of how you uh, lost this client. Um, oh, you want to, you're, you're poking the bear. <laughs> Well, uh, l- listen. Uh, th- we can let's have this. You share what you can share. A, share what you no, can no. share. I'll, I'll, I'll let's have this as a tangent, and I will give you one of the things that really pisses me off. And it's really hard for this to not come across as sour grapes, which is why I didn't want to bring it up. But you're kind of you poke the bear. So I, I don't know if this has happened uh, on your part, but there are a lot of people out there right now, as coaches, as business consultants. Um, that are working. We'll have to send it. We'll have to put a link to our uh, coaching episodes. We've talked about. We did talk. We did talk about this, which is why we shouldn't go too deep on this. But I think one of the things that you guys need to recognize and realize, and not be um, not be so naive about, a lot of these business coaches, uh, a don't know all that much about digital marketing, and we've run that across that a, a lot. Um, but B, and and I. And I can't validate this, but it, I'm certain that this happened because I know who the um, who we lost this this client to. They, they're making kickbacks, and you, Guy, right. you and I get you and I get offered this all the time, right? So we've got these referral relationships. Let's send money back and forth. You know, Guy and I, my my the people that I send referrals to, and and this is true with Guy, and there's a there's a couple of other people, and I like to work that way because if you don't you end up with a incentive to send business to someone who doesn't deserve it. And that I well, think, go ahead. I, I so I, I'm, I don't even have the issue as much with like, you want to make a commission fine. My issue is, and this, and, you know, this happens, happens to us too. This, the, the, the third party intermediary person who's got, that's building this coaching relationship. They've got this kickback. They don't disclose that they're okay. making money off of it. Right. That's you so keep that's going to the thing. ethical disclosure side of things. right? Yeah. I think you got to, I think you gotta be like, Hey, look, th- you know, I don't care how you say it. This is our, this is our trusted partner. We do receive a commission. I mean, you've got it. You're supposed to be publicizing when you make money off this stuff under a variety of FTC rules. I think it's only fair that you're telling people that you're making money and, and the bigger issue, and, and lawyers know this even because lawyers do referrals too. Sure. When you make these, when you make these referrals and there's a referral fee, you're putting it in the, you should be putting in your fee agreement that there's a referral going on, referral relationship. You know that's the right thing to do. But the bigger issue is, is that if you, if in the lawyer to lawyer context, you're only making referrals, hopefully, to lawyers that you feel like are going to do a good job. And I will tell That's you right. that in our industry, that is not always the case. There are a lot of situations where the coaches are consultants. They've got the referral thing, but they don't even know heads or tails about whether to vet right. the partner at all. They're they're just you know. And so again, and this, so this is why we're here in Colorado, um, because uh, this happened to Conrad. And again, we're we're going to protect the identities of everybody involved here. Sure. We're going to pick somebody that's nothing to do with our story. So don't. And who's listening to this is like. Ooh, this is going to be some negative selling, but we think people should be aware of it. And that's what brought us to looking at the Denver PI market. And and that's why I have the sour grapes, Guy, is this was a this was a client for whom we were actually talking about doing a case study about how great things were going. And then all of a sudden it disappeared, right? Um, yeah. And, and then as, again, and, and, and so here's, here's the other side of the coin is, and I, we, okay. we, I know you believe this too, is... Um, you just want them to make an informed decision, right? Like yeah. at the end of the day, we look at, I look at it like this. If, if one of our clients leaves because of this, because some coach convinced them that, you know, we didn't do a good enough job articulating the value of what we're doing, uh, because it was easy for them to make the switch. Now, again, that's an uphill battle when you're going against somebody who's got this incentive and is doing a hard sell and everything. And it is what it is. Um, but we want, we just want people to be informed. And so that's why we're yep. going to walk through, uh, at least in this case, we, we've talked about doing um, quote unquote teardowns before. 
Um, but again, this is just an arbitrary firm that we've chosen from the Denver market. Um, this isn't anybody thing to do with the story that we're telling, but that's hence why we're in Denver. We did, however, choose this carefully because we wanted to be able to share some things that we would do differently. Yeah. So the firm that we're going to look us at is Bacchus Schenker, personal injury lawyers. One of the first things, I don't know if you do this, Guy, but one of the very first things I do when I'm looking at a, at, at, at a new website, scroll down to the bottom right of the homepage and see who's doing their work. I, I find that they're frequently, I don't think I've ever gone wrong when I'm like, oh, these guys are working with X, Y, or Z, so they're probably well taken care of. Or these guys are working with A, B, and C, and, and th they have a major problem, right? So let me use an obvious example. If I walk in and I find a Scorpion site, I already know what the pain points are for that law firm. They might not even know what those are, but like we know. And the same is true for people who work on like WordPress sites. I think, do you do, you do this? Do you see your very, very first thing? Look at who's doing the work. I do. Um, yeah. and, and I'll say this though, for uh, people that are vetting their agencies this way, it's a horrible way to vet <laughs> because, uh, you know, while Conrad's right, we do it as well. We do tend to know the pain points, especially for the, with some of the bigger players in the mar in the industry. The issue that that you that you all are missing out on is you don't know when they started with this business. You don't know what uh, engagement that they've actually are paying for, and so you know this is the classic paradigm: is you do a search in your local market, you see who's ranking, you scroll down to the bottom, and you're like, "Well, they're doing it for my competitor. They're going to be able to do it for me." And that is an absolutely horrible way to go about vetting your agency, in my humble opinion. Also, because your firm and your competitors' firm live in very different realities from an asset and liabilities perspective. Um, and you and if they're working with your competition, there's, uh, you know, we can go back about the exclusivity. No, thing. I, you, yep. you explained to me how they're going to help you rank in the local pack for your head terms, as well as the people down the street. So I love consult webs. That is one of my digs on the, I think they work with two or maybe three firms in a given market. That's how they've kind of defined their exclusivity. Um, Guy and I believe I believe I'm, I'm not speaking out of, out of church for you, but we kind of believe in a, a, a one person to the prom kind of perspective. Um, but, uh, you know, consult us does a good, good, good job. We, so we moved yeah, on. Look at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you're getting the result, if you're hitting the objective, like, you know, and you're, and you're informed about it. I think that's the other big thing. Are you informed that you know that they're working with the, I mean, obviously if you did the shop, you know that they're working with this firm down the street because you picked them that way. So you can't be upset yeah. about that. No, no, no. Okay, back at Shanker. Let's get get to it. Right off the bat, you said it's ColoradoLaw.net. So interestingly, very interestingly, back at Shanker, from my understanding, is a fairly big brand advertiser, offline advertiser in the Denver market, and yet they are using a domain, also a .net domain, which I don't super love. Uh, and they also, interestingly, as I look at the site, they've got a two 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 two. Uh, for Denver and Fort Collins and Colorado Springs, they've got the eights. So they they are clearly doing some offline branding in three different markets, and it's not necessarily represented with uh, their URL. So there there may be some interesting um, branding issues there. I'll always roll down to the the bottom as I mentioned to see who is actually doing their work. And in this this example, I, I like this because we don't know. We have no idea who is doing the work for this, so we're not flaming a specific competitor on this, but that is certainly something that I look at. I also, I'm just looking at the site, Guy, overall, kind of busy, really heavy on the call to actions. We've got, at least on the homepage, there are one, two, three, four, five call to actions before you even start scrolling. Um, and, you know, it's, it's okay. The design's okay. It certainly doesn't blow me away. I don't think they're losing business because of poor design, but they're certainly not incremental business because of amazing conversions. And that is a completely subjective perspective. Would you agree on that? Guy, is that something you look at as well? Yeah. We, I mean, we look, I, I'm, I don't care about prettiness, honestly. Okay. I'm like, does, do I think this is going to convert or not? Um, and I think that uh, generally speaking, they're hitting a lot of the high notes on conversion. You know, it's not one of these sites where you come in and it's like obvious that they went in a cab to nowhere to try to win a Webby or something. Um, you know, this is a site designed for conversion. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, and again, I encourage folks to do this on their own. Uh, I'm looking at it on my iPhone. It's got the call cool. us yep. and get a free consultation as the primary call to action. But I'll tell you a big mistake, and a lot of you are doing this. They've got the, what I'm calling the intaker problem. 
Yep. They've got the uh, interstitial that pops up on mobile, blacks out the entire screen, uh, and that's a no-no. That's a bad. That's a bad experience. And in fact, you know, Google has talked about how uh, they don't like that experience. They're not trying to reward that experience on mobile as well. If you're using one of these widgets, it's great, but make it on demand. Somebody, the user has to click on something to make it come up not popping up out of nowhere and blocking out the entire screen. And blocking out the entire screen includes, and the, the, this is why this is so relevant and obvious, if you take a moment to think about it, that includes blocking out the phone number while you are right. holding a phone wanting to talk to this firm. So That's right. that is absolutely a problem. All right, the next thing Guy, I always run is just a site colon search. I love knowing mm -hmm. what's what is a site colon there. search, Conrad. So if you go to google.com, it's a tool, G O O G L E, and do a <laughs> S I T. <laughs> we're getting funny here. Um, the site colon search is you do S I T E colon, and then you put in the, the URL. And it is not the dub, 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 HTTPS, none of that stuff. It is just site colon Colorado law.net. That is going to show you all of the pages that Google has indexed. And you can actually- Well, not all of them. Well, some, it's gonna show you, it's, it, it's, gonna, give you it a, it's not, gonna give you a good benchmark of how many pages are indexed. Not only how many pages are indexed, but also some, you can walk through and look at the pages. And so what I like to do is, you know, Google, uh, Guy mentioned not all of them. If you hit tools right here, you can see actually the number of pages that a site has indexed or that, that Google is showing up in the site colon search. In this case, it's 827. And that brings up a question for me right off of the bat, Guy. 827 pages isn't a massive site, but it is by no means a small site. And so I start to wonder what type of content they have. And I suspect with 800, when you're knocking on the door of 1,000 or over 1,000, it's often that you have a bunch of pages that are completely useless. And you know I what I like to do right go, after go. this kind of search? Yeah drop the uh, minus in URL blog and see how many oh. pages that are not blog posts. Ah. Okay, funny the key. So he did this. I do. I run this a little bit differently. If you actually run, if you find out what their URL starts, this is exactly what, exactly what to do. So if you run that, uh, if you want to know how many pages are within a folder in this example blog, you can run the site colon. So it was 827 pages before. 591 pages of those 827 are in their blog, which suggests to me that there is a bunch of useless content in their blog. And what I did is I kind of rolled through this and found a bunch of useless content in their blog. So, I mean, think about this, 78, I'm pulling numbers out of the air right now, 527, 591 divided by 827 uh, is roughly, mid mid three quarters of the content is on a blog. This suggests to me that this, the vendor that is servicing this account is probably delivering a set number of blogs on the regular. And that is part of their deliverables. And I will also suspect, and we can't look at this because we don't have access to their GA, that most of those blogs are not generating any traffic. And if they are generating traffic, they're not generating business. And so one of the things, the reason I love this cycle, and you can do this really, really quickly, is you can start finding a bunch of what I will call useless content. And in the blog world, again, you can just run through the, 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 the blog and, and look through some of these, these pages. I pulled out two specifically that are completely useless in different ways. Here is tips on staying safe on the ski slopes this winter, okay? Uh, with some really paltry amount of content and I, I suspect, and I don't know this key, but if you are in Colorado uh, looking for tips on staying safe in the ski slopes this winter, you're not going to land on a law firm website. And if you do land on a law firm website and you read this, it's it's things like wear a <laughs> helmet, right? I, I don't think that's really relevant. I found another example here that I thought was gross. Um this is different, but again, you can see up here in the URL, it's in the blog. This is in memory of Anna Pryor. This is an example of the, the only SEO rationale for doing this is to hope to get people who are looking for this teenager who was killed tragically uh, in, in, an, in an auto accident. You'll note here that the, the, this blog was, was launched in 2024, 
uh, sorry, 2024. The accident happened almost 20 years earlier in 2006, right? And this is a girl who was killed. Um, and it ends with a call to action, right? If you know a friend or family member involved in an abusive relationship, please contact the blah, blah, blah. This is, this is content for content's sake and it's gross. And I think if someone were to unfortunately land on this page, I actually did a, a query for Anna Pryor and this actually ranks for that name. Th this is gross. This does not give anyone a really, really solid feel. And this is an example of using generating traffic for traffic's sake, maybe. So those are, are, are some of the things that we found. The other things like you can find often, this is a page, uh, and I, I found this through the site colon search. This is a page where it's just, here's the founding partners. And there's a link to Kyle and Darren, and then generic content that lives elsewhere across the web, right? So this is a useless page with, with absolutely zero unique content on this. And it's just a page that, that shouldn't exist. So there's lots of pages on here that aren't really helpful. Here's another one, Colorado Law Blog. This is just a link to all of the articles on their blog. None of this content is unique. This is an example of a page that should never be indexed, right? It's just, it's just navigation. It should never, never be indexed. So these are examples of pages where I look at this from like, their, their 827 pages are not really, really helpful. Anything else you want to talk about with Psychology? No, I, I think the biggest thing for me is directionally, how do you compare um, in terms of your investment in content? And, and I do, I agree with you that I think one of the biggest missed opportunities is that all the content's living under the blog yeah. subdirectory. Um, I think that if you've, if you've been following at all what Google's been doing recently, um, you know, these individual blog pages are getting hammered, right? It's all these, you know, all the helpful content update is all about these small publishing sites just getting hammered. You know, some of them are trying to recover, but it's clear that creating topical authority hubs, um, meaning pages with sub pages that are topically relevant, that are internally linked in a uh, more um, useful way, Google's trying to reward that. And, you know, this, the days of these, of trying to just create a permutation of every query you can think of as a question to create a blog post. Like that's the stuff that you're just seeing to Conrad's point. If you, if you open up Google analytics, if you open up search console, you're just going to see that those pages exist and they're not really providing any value to users at all. And they're not generating any traffic. So I'm going to go a quick view through Screaming Frog because and show you exactly what Guy is talking about visually. Screaming Frog is kind of an advanced SEO querying tool. Um, I look at this all the time when I'm talking to, to law firms. Um, but one of the things that you can actually see in Screaming Frog is what's called site structure. And it is the, the, the depth to which you can find content. The, and so a, a large site with roughly a thousand pages, the vast majority of those pages live just three clicks deep, right? From the homepage. And something that has real structure with that volume of pages, those pages are going to be distributed further into silos about what that content is about. And that's what Guy is talking about. Screaming Frog, one of the great tools to look at. The other things that I look at in Screaming Frog, Guy, I don't know if you look at these, I'm always looking for a 404, right? So if you find a page that's 404 error, uh, that's a great example. Frankly, when I'm talking to a law firm, be like, hey, you've got some broken pages on your site. And better yet, if you find links to those pages that are broken, that's an even better example of like, you you really aren't looking. In, in this example here, I'm not seeing any of those. Yeah, and the, I, you, though, just to add on to that, the other thing yeah. that people should know, Screaming Frog, if you're doing this, one of these Screaming Frog crawls, they do integrate with Search Console, Google Analytics, and like the major th uh, third-party uh, link data tools. So you can, the stuff that we kind of and I are talking about, like, hey, do you have a 404 page that's actually got links to it from that's identifiable one of the link indices? You can look quickly see that um, when you use these integrations in Screaming Frog. Yeah. Um, and these are things like if your agency is missing this, you've got low hanging fruit and mistakes and, and it's kind of careless. Now, do we have clients where we've run into 404s on occasion? Yeah, but that's why yeah. we look at these things over and over again because things break, right? And things changes happen. Yeah, I think that's a really good point too is, is that, you know, as we know, the web's dynamic, websites are dynamic. Um, yeah. That's why this stuff isn't set it and forget it. Yeah, absolutely. It's gardening. Um, so I look for 404s. I always look at the H1s. I'm always looking for H1s where you have the same exact H1 showing up over and over again. That used to be a 
pretty big common problem where H1s would be repeated. Uh, when I look through this, you can also find some of the pages on here that are completely useless. And the other thing I don't love on this, I'm not quite sure why they've got caps on some of these H1s. It's just kind of... Why well, I, I agree. I, here's the other thing too that I think with, when you're talking about heading tags, like if you notice the homepage is missing an H1 tag ah! altogether. This is one of this is one of those examples of like, great. you know, they coded the H2, but they didn't code the H1 on the homepage. And then the other thing, to Conrad's point, like, you know, they, they've got to be, some of these are pretty generic. I bet you if you sorted them by, um, you know, alphanumeric, you would see that a lot of them are pretty close to duplicative. They're not very descriptive. Um, again, I, you know, I think that the on-page uh, uh, mappings, you know, uh, URL structure, H1 tags, uh, meta descriptions, th these are important things, especially when, you're, you, when you realize that you're in an age of uh, Google where they're using user click-through data. These are your opportunities to increase the number of clicks, and you're not getting an increase of number of clicks with these generic page titles and meta descriptions. So interestingly, on the H1 side of things, they actually have two H1s on their homepage, uh, one of which is blank. So oh, they have an empty. Out. They have an empty. <laughs> so that's, I mean, a, another example. It's, I bet so, you, I bet you, you know, I didn't look. I bet you it's the logo. I bet you the logo is an H1. So coding mistakes is just sloppy code. So Guy, while you're doing that, we're going to take a break. Guy's going to share his screen. We're going to look at some more tools. And we're back from the break. And we're still talking about uh, this website for uh, Bacchus and Shanker. Uh, another thing, another tool that I like to use when we're looking at websites for visibility and assessment is Local Falcon. Now, Local Falcon will show um, API local pack rankings for a query and a business on a grid. There's a lot of different local pack tracking tools that we'd like to use, but we wanted to call out Local Falcon. And in, in fact, it's a little bit of foreshadowing because we're going to do a deep dive on some of the other ways, interesting ways that we use Local Falcon um, for a variety of different purposes. But from understanding the uh, competitive environment of a firm and, and getting a sense of like, hey, you know, where are their opportunities? Uh, local Falcon is a great tool for that. So this, what this is showing, and for folks that are uh, seeing this, we're looking at a visual map. It's a grid. Uh, for the query personal injury attorney. And what it's showing is where um, Bacchus and Shanker ranks in this grid. And it's also showing competitors. So, you know, as we're looking at this, you can see like they're on the east side of this grid, east of uh, where uh, Local Falcon is identifying downtown Denver, you know, we're seeing ones and twos, meaning that their, 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 their visibility in the local pack is pretty sound. Uh, the other thing that you can look, you can do a review analysis, but just kind of like some of the top level things that we like to look at, you know, how many reviews do they have? One of the biggest things that we talk about is you can rank all day, but if you don't have a competitive number of reviews, like don't rely heavily in the short term on local pack for generating business because it's not going to convert as well uh, if you don't have those reviews. And let's face it, reviews are also a ranking factor. Hey, he, thing, though, can you like, just go ahead? Can you explain for our dear listener? Uh, how you have zeroed in on Denver with your query of personal injury attorney? How how, how where where did the, the center of this graph get defined? Yeah, so the center of this graph is defined by the location of the firm. So, uh, the, you know, local Falcon will ask you what business you want to run a grid for, and they put the business, the address of the business, at the center of the grid, which is really fascinating. And in, in this specific example, where you're seeing. They're not ranking where their office is, but as you go outside of downtown to the east, they are. So this is a, a, an, an interesting and probably I would call a typical graph. Not sorry, not yeah. a space typical. I mean atypical. Yeah, it, it's true that you usually don't see this pattern, except that um, you know in some some of these downtown areas there are mm -hmm. some weird patterns depending on the competitive nature and and how. Um, you know, things are optimized, but you know, you can, you, anyway, these are also sorted by, uh, sorted by share of local voice. Uh, and so, and this grid based on their positions for the number of data points that they've got and their average position, they are the share of local voice leader for this grid. It's just odd that it's, it's so heavily weighted East of Denver, um, and so, you know, some of the, there might be some, some deeper analysis to unpack there, but I, the, the thing that I like to see is. How are we lining up against other firms that we're competing with in that local grid? 
uh, from a visibility standpoint and also from a review standpoint. And then the other really useful thing that we use this for, and I'm curious your thoughts, um, because in these types of grids and these competitive environments, your proximity matters a lot. And so this is a great tool for advising on whether we should open a new office location yeah. and where we should do that. 100% I would look at this in terms of office location. And and, and the, other, the other thing that you could, even before that is, should we be opening another office location or do we need to be doubling down on our existing location because that's where the reviews or or, or a, an existing location have we maxed out the potential not even maxed out but are, are the returns of incremental improvements for office a there compared to trying build to trying to build out office b right um and, and i do think this is one where you can spend a lot of time and this is time that should be spent on determining a should I, do I need to keep working on building out, for example, reviews of my current office, or if I maxed out the potential of where I can go, because there is a distance at which competitors start cropping up where you can no longer really compete because that ranking factor of proximity is so key. But then if you do have that one office nailed, where should we go next? Like this is a great tool for guiding mathematically what I call the centipede strategy of, of office of, of building out offices around a market. I, I also like to see um, the competitive landscape in terms of like keywords in the business name, you know, in a lot of these competitive locations is in this one included back as Schenker is using this strategy, you know, personal injury lawyers is part of the business name. Um, so one, when we're validating, the first thing we'll do is to make sure they've actually updated their business name with the, the state bar and with the state, um, you know, entity licensing, because if they haven't, those firms that are showing up there, they're vulnerable to being, you know, uh, having an impact based on being reported or edited. And that can have an impact on how competitive it is to rank in that local pack. So in this particular case- What he really meant to say was if he finds a competitor to Smith & Jones Law Firm who hasn't done that, they are vulnerable to, to getting kicked out of this. They are. And the other question is, is, you know, uh, how many of the firms that are ranking are deploying that strategy? Because in some locations you'll see like nobody's deploying it. Um, and in other places, like everybody is, and that can, uh, weigh in your decision of like, whether or not you update your domain, right? Like, do you do an exact match domain with keyword rich in the business name? In some areas that can be a huge competitive difference maker in more competitive spaces where they're already doing that. It's not as big of an issue. All right. Uh, another tool that we like to look at is uh, Ahrefs um, and get a sense of uh, the backlinks, really. Uh, there are other things you can look at in here. I know, and we've talked about third-party tools uh, and the reliability of the data. I'm not huge at looking at uh, organic traffic metrics, but backlink profile and the backlink profile within the competitive landscape those are things that I like uh, to look at uh, over a variety of terms. And you can also, get, you can dive deep and look at the referring domains. And to me, this is one of those two where you're like, um, this, sh this can show you how much of a vulnerability you might have in terms of some of your historical backlinking, depending on, you know, what kind of backlinking you look at. What types of links, what types of things do you look for in backlink? Or do you look at backlink profile at all when you're doing uh, an initial kind of assessment? I used to spend a lot of time looking for spam, right? Like, I mean, this goes way back in the day and I looked for a bunch of, of crappy backlinks. The thing that I like to look for now, and this is more of a competitive research, but this is the, the impossible to quantify thing that you and I talk about all the time. How many of their backlinks are actually local, right? And this is what you want to talk to Joy about. And, and, a, and a firm that is doing an amazing, you, the only way I can, I've ever come up with, with identifying that the localness of links is to spend a lot of time going through a backlink profile and you're not like this is organized right now or it's not right now but um this is often organized by dr right so domain rank mm -hmm. most of your localized links aren't going to show up at the top of that dr sort and so it's really a painstaking process of going you know item by item by item looking for those backlinks doing that for yourself as well as for competitors and that to me is a major indicator as to whether or not is there potential here right if you have a backlink if you have a dr of 40 and zero localized backlinks but you've got an otherwise solid review profile i feel like we can move the needle for you 
if you've done an amazing job of localized backlinks, which you haven't, if you're listening to this, you probably have not done an amazing job of that. Then maybe there's no there's no more growth for that individual office, right? So you got all the back localized backlinks, you've got a ton of localized reviews, but there's not much room, more room for us to actually move your needle. And so I, I look for those opportunities where it's 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 easy to get some victories. Low hanging fruit, right? Totally. Um, the other thing too, to, to Conrad's point that you can do to help uh, filter by localized links is you can add a location modifier like your city name to the uh, target URL contains. So sometimes that'll pick up local. You can do it in the domain. Sometimes, you know, local sites might have like, you know, denvernews.com might be a thing. Um, but there's another way to kind of sort by identifying some of those uh, local links with the tool. You know, so here's an example, Denver Insider. That's probably more go. Localized, yep. at least, just as an example. And then, amazingly, down there, there's Las Vegas Law Biz for this <laughs> Denver-based law firm, which looks to me like a whole bunch of spam. Yeah, and and again, I think in terms of competitive analysis, you got to bucket these things in terms of uh, links that we think are mattering, links that we probably don't think matter, and then links that might actually be more of a liability uh, uh, than a benefit. Uh, you want to show broken play. links here? Sure. Because that's a beauty one too, and also something that we should be able to find fairly, fairly quickly, and sh and should really not exist. Yeah, and it looks like this one doesn't have a name. There you go. A the so, null data set's really valuable here. Right, and so uh, just describe what you just did for yeah. people that aren't following along the video. Great question. So if if you w there are plenty of tools. We already talked about um, uh, Screaming Frog but we're now using uh, a hrefs to look for links coming to your website that go to pages that no longer exist. And that is the easiest, lowest hanging SEO fruit you could possibly come up with. Um, and yet we find these on the regular. And so um, the tool a hrefs on your backlink profile, you can do there's actually a report for broken backlinks, which will show you both where that link is coming from. So uh, is it a valuable link? And then it'll show you the page, the URL that is actually pointed to. So you can either redirect that or recreate that or, or in, in some way recapture the value of that link. Yeah. And, and again, in a link by link basis, you can also see things like whether it's followed or no followed. Um, from a competitive standpoint, the other thing that we like to look at uh, backlinks is it gives you a good insight onto some of the strategies that have worked for competition. So um, you know, you, you'll see like scholarship links will pop up yes, in here. Are. Some of like the local map and campaign, uh, you know, the, the different types of localized uh, content campaigns. This is a good way to do competitive intel to see what they're doing that's worked for and with what sites it's worked on. And and with along with that, what you're getting here is when these links were found. So one of the things, one of the difficulties in doing this is there's linking strategies that worked 15 years ago that will still show up in here. So you can actually look at like, and you can ignore those linking strategies that are really, really dated. What are they, what's happening now? What are they doing right now? How active are they now in developing links? What does that look like? Because you can actually see this by at the link level. And there's also a graph in Ahrefs that'll show you what that link profile looks like over time. That's another one that I like to look at when that, that link profile spikes, you know, all of a sudden we got 1200 links on November 7th. Um, that tells you a lot about what that firm is trying to, or what their, that firm's agency is trying to do to drive links and therefore traffic. Yeah. And again, this is also a good thing to have a conversation with your own agency about, um, you know, what are some of your strategies? How are we, uh, you know, leading indicators? If you're, if you're, um, part of your service offering or engagement includes grow backlink growth, what types of things are they doing? Um, I think having those conversations is healthy, even if you're not shopping around for a new agency, but just having uh, valuable conversations with your current agency. And, I, and just to riff on that, if your agency is reporting, we got seven backlinks and you're like, good job, you're supposed to get seven backlinks. That is a problem because you're not probably talking. I can get you seven backlinks right now. I can get you. Well, not all links are links. created equally, right? That is my point. So yeah. evaluating someone on the number of links that they are reporting that they have generated for you is probably not a good way to think about your SEO from an overall perspective. Yeah. Another thing that I want to bring up, and I think this is a good, you know, this isn't so much like website teardown as it is um, when you're doing an assessment of any kind of competitor is looking at uh, what they're mm. doing on other platforms, you know, Great. because again, the you know YouTube social media, um, it's going to play a role in 
And frankly, it's inter to me, it's interconnected with SEO, right? Like um, your ability to distribute content on social networks is going to play some role in whether your ability to also uh, earn links and earn meaningful attention. Um, this YouTube channel, uh, pretty robustly built out. They've definitely made some investment. You've got 264 videos. Um, one thing too that we look for is, uh, you know, potential issues with rules of professional conduct. You know, they've got Denver's best injury lawyers. A lot of times firms don't even realize that some of that messaging is in there, you know, pulling up, um, is arguable that under the Colorado rules of professional conduct, um, 7.1, that it's arguable that using superlatives like best might be, uh, not, uh, objectively substantiational, uh, substantial, <laughs> Sub substantial. Thank you. No, that's not, that's not it either. No, don't blow the ethics rules with your vendor because of your vendor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't blow the ethics rules because your vendor, um, and, uh, but there are also firms that are finding creative ways to be able to use this. So instead of saying, you know, Denver's best injury lawyers, you can have content that's like, how to identify the best injury lawyers in Denver, right? That can be, uh, and as long as it's not like just choose us, then you can get into ways of uh, in incorporating superlatives into your content uh, in an ethical way. But again, for me, like I'm like I'm looking at like some of these videos, especially with firms that have done, they're doing a lot of brand building, which you, you can tell this firm is doing. This is a great place to identify, um, you know, what they're doing in offline media in terms of TV commercials. Sometimes they'll even, some people will post like videos of like their billboards or have imagery of their billboards on their social profiles. Uh, you can also use the Facebook and LinkedIn ads library to look at competitors and see what they're doing from an ads perspective. Uh, this is another thing that we like to look at when we're uh, looking at new clients and, and new competitive uh, environments, because this brand stuff, it does matter a lot. And uh, there are uh, benefits there. You know, we've talked about this before on the pod, uh, if you are indexing high on clicks to through brand queries, those signals are positive signals that our Google is using to be able to decide, make decisions about showing your pages for a non-brand too. And so getting a sense of what the brand uh, looks like in the competitive environment is a very useful thing for us to look at. I'll counterpoint this, Guy. Look at the, the, the content here is nine years old. This does not look like they're spending a lot of time. 16 years ago, Jesus Christ. Um. The, to me, and again, I haven't. We, we're looking at this almost in real time. Oh, we've got some. Well, that was stuff that here. was that was sort of by, that was sorted by popularity. So now it's sort. Of, so for folks that are looking, I'm on the YouTube channel. Okay. You can sort by popularity. You can sort by latest. But you know, they've they've they published stuff three weeks ago, a month ago. Interestingly, though, and this is another one of those indicators. Uh, and this is what the questions I'd be asking. Uh, you know, recently their content within the ne the last weeks, months, uh, five months ago. Uh, all the way up to really about a year ago. Yeah. You know, you got 11 views, 14 views, 15 views, and then there's 11,000 or no, uh, yeah, 11,000 views, 4,000 views. Something changed, right? How did they go from averaging 11,000, 4,000 to 15 views? What they happened? Stopped, they've stopped advertising. They have decided that spending money to get their videos in front of people is not worth it. That's what's or even that's I think that's a that's a good very strong possibility. Um, sadly, and again, I don't want to cast aspersions at them, but we have seen too where people have paid for um, you know fake oh, promotion of videos, geez. right? Ah. Now and again, in well, light hold on, of hold on. The, let me just explain to our dear audience: fake promotion. What does that mean, Guy? What's going on? What What are you? Nah, he's not accusing, but like, what What could someone be doing to make this looks good? Yeah, you go and you uh, go to Upwork and you say, uh, you know, with your YouTube, it will pay you a dollar to go in and uh, watch this YouTube video, right? It's not, there's no value. It's not an actual valuable view. It's just to inflate the social numbers. And, you know, arguably under the FTC's new rule, that stuff is against the rule. It's the same thing as paying people to uh, like your pages or follow you or engage those are, are artificial social signals are expressly listed in the FTC rules. And so it'd be interesting to see again, to your point, will there be enforcement? My view is, is that somebody's going to get made an example of, it's going to be like uh, tax audits, right? They're only going to audit like 2% of them, but the people that they catch, they're going to hit pretty hard. Now that we've scared the crap out of you and talked about what we see when we pull back the curtain, what we look for when we pull back the curtain, I hope you can go back to your own site, spend some time and Think about whether or not your site's got a whole bunch of useless content, how to look at the links, some of the tools that we use. Go download Screaming Frog and get really deep under the hood if you want to find out 
what's going on on your site and where we would look if we were looking for a problem with your site and what your potential is. As always, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Hopefully, you got some actionable tips you can take back to your marketing team or your agency or things you can fix on your own website. Um, that's the whole goal here so that you have some uh, examples of some of the things that we look at. If you had questions about this, please drop us a comment, right? We're, we're happy to do specific deep dives. If you've got a site you want to see torn down, you want to see a competitor's site torn down, let us know. We're happy to pick them apart. Um, if you're just landing on Lunch Hour Legal Marketing for the first time, please do hit that subscribe button on your podcast, Widjumabab, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, Conrad and Gee saying farewell. Money makes a money makes a it makes a world go round. Money makes a world go yeah, money round. make a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round. Yeah, money make a world go round.